what I'm going to be speaking about today is uh, based on some joint research uh, projects that I've been working on. One project with uh, Viral Acharya uh, from NYU, who's on leave now as the deputy governor of the Reserve Bank of India. That's a slightly more technical paper on infrastructure financing. The other project is with my colleague at uh, Columbia Business School, Patrick Bolton, uh, who has thought about this issue uh, for a long time. And we, prepare, we are preparing a position paper for the Governor's Council on Infrastructure in the United States. They're going to hold a conference sometime this year, and we are preparing a position paper. So what we are going to be discussing today is drawn out of those two uh, projects. OK, let me uh, start with uh, uh, some of the items that uh, I hope to cover with you today. I want to start with uh, challenges and the scale of uh, infrastructure financing. Give you some facts about the magnitude of the problem, uh, the potential social benefits that can accrue by investing in infrastructure. And yet the paradoxical fact is that it's not easy for us to attract private sector capital into infrastructure. So the private benefits uh, or the private returns uh, to financiers may not be that great, even though the social returns to the economy can be significant. So I want to uh, start off uh, with some of the challenges in the scale of infrastructure financing. And I want to quickly go through some of the key players uh, in the infrastructure financing. Here we're going to talk about government and government agencies. We're going to talk about the infra builders, the financiers, and development banks. Okay. And then uh, take a look at a couple of uh, you know, infrastructure projects that are done very well abroad, whether we can draw some uh, you know, uh, uh, useful uh, uh, insights from how they succeeded uh, in executing some infrastructure projects. And then finally, talk a little bit about the research on infrastructure and what are some of the insights that we can learn uh, from the research. That's going to be the agenda uh, for today. Sorry about the busy slides. Uh, I'll uh, summarize this for you uh, very quickly. So if you look at some of the studies that have been done by IMF, World Bank, and so forth, uh, you'll quickly find that uh, the economists quickly recognize that infrastructure investment is good in improving the productivity and the GDP of the country. This is not very surprising. If you have top flight infrastructure in terms of roads, highways, uh, you know, metros, and so on and so forth, you're moving the human capital, you're moving the goods and services uh, to the ports, you're able to export, you're able to import in an efficient way that's going to improve the social return uh, to the economy. But then if you think about uh, the nature of the infrastructure investment, uh, we realize that often some of these infrastructure projects take dozens of years. There could be cost overruns. There could be significant delays in executing the project, right? A lot of the costs are front-loaded. The benefits are back-loaded, right? So this is the kind of the project, uh, you know, cash flows uh, stream that we are looking at. And the cash flow stream themselves depend upon uh, the diligence of different players who are involved in the infrastructure project, government, uh, you know, infra builders, uh, financiers, and so forth. So that's a very complicated structure that we need to deal with. And as an asset class, the infrastructure asset class is very unique because of the very long duration. And so if you think about banks financing the infrastructure, and of course banks do finance infrastructure, and if you ask about how banks finance themselves, they tend to finance themselves using deposits. 60, 65% of the financing is done through uh, deposits, which are short term. So there's a huge duration gap right, between the infrastructure assets, which have long duration, and the funding, which is short duration. So we need to think about who are more natural players in terms of uh, delivering financing uh, from the private sector. So what is the empirical evidence that we see? We see a huge funding gap right, uh, between the needs uh, in the infrastructure area in terms of the amount of money that needs to be put in place uh, and in terms of what is available with the public sector as well as with the private sector. What, what's the problem with the public sector? If you take India, for example, uh, we have a financing deficit, right? We have uh, both current account deficit and we have deficit uh, in the capital account. So the ability of the government to produce right, uh, investment uh, financing is somewhat limited, especially if there are competing needs. You could put that money in education. You could put, uh, you know, put that money in healthcare. So, you know, what's the argument for putting that money in infrastructure? So, there are competing needs that we need to think about. So, we really ought to ask ourselves: Well, is there some way government can catalyze investment from private sector? 
And if so, which are the private sector parties who are best suited to meet that challenge? Now, uh, just to give you a little bit of numbers, uh, you know, the world infrastructure needs, uh, you know, currently are pegged at about $3.3 trillion per year. That is the kind of the investment needs that are needed, uh, according to a recent research uh, report that was published by McKinsey. And what are the benefits? The social benefits are very clear. IMF estimates that a 1% permanent increase, you know, by way of GDP, a fraction of the GDP put into infrastructure in 10 years' time will deliver about 2.5% increase in output. So clearly, the social benefits are there uh, to be had. So uh, in terms of, you know, obtaining the financing, or there's some natural private sector parties who are out there, uh, we can think about sovereign wealth fund, we can think about pension funds, insurance companies with very long duration uh, you know, liabilities who may be natural players in this area, but it won't be easy for us to draw uh, their money into infrastructure unless certain conditions are met. Okay, I'm not going to go through this slide in much detail, but just to point out that we have government agencies which get necessarily engaged in infrastructure projects because they have to do the land clearance, environmental clearance, they have to set the rates, uh, you know, they have to monitor and they have to regulate the various players in the infrastructure project. So the government is going to be a very big player. This is not typical in corporate investment decisions, but infrastructure investment decisions, government is going to be a big player. We have, of course, the financiers, right? We talked about the sovereign wealth fund, pension funds, and insurance companies. Before they put their money in infrastructure project, they'll want some assurance that the contracts will be enforced, right? The commitments will be enforced. There'll be no expropriation. There'll be no corruption, and so on and so forth. So we need to think about the contracting uh, you know, arrangements to allay some of those concerns. And of course, the infra builders, right? Uh, they're going to be the builders of the highways, you know, the bridges, and so on and so forth and we need to figure out the incentives that they need to have to deliver the job uh, you know, as promised at the time the infrastructure project is initiated. And of course, we have the development financiers. The China Development Bank would be a classic example, uh, which has been a success story in sort of capacity building, acquiring the necessary skills, funding, and providing credit enhancement for infrastructure projects. So these are the four players uh, that are involved in infrastructure financing. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, the second part of the presentation, which is that given these challenges and given the different players who are involved in infrastructure, what is the contracting problem? So in economics, this is called double model hazard. What's a model hazard problem? Uh, you know, I depend on you, your diligence in terms of generating the cash flows, but I don't observe the effort that you're putting in. So I need to figure out a way to make sure that you're putting in the appropriate effort to deliver the cash flow. And here, there are two players, right, uh, that the financier is depending on, the infrastructure builders, right? So when investors are putting their money in, uh, they don't know that the infrastructure builder is producing the appropriate uh, quality material. They're going to deliver the job on time, right? And in fact, the expected life of the bridge or the expected life of the highway is going to be what it is uh, when the infrastructure project commences, right? That is a model hazard problem. You need to figure out a contracting arrangement to sort that. And of course, the government is involved, right? When the government is involved, are they going to do the land clearance, uh, land acquisition? Are they going to do the environmental clearance in time, right? Are they going to live by the contract? Uh, you know, if there is a delay, are they going to make a compensation, right? All those issues, again, are going to come into play. This is called the double model hazard uh, problem in development finance. And another issue, which is somewhat, uh, you know, endemic in infrastructure project is corruption, right? Uh, you know, or the corrupt bureaucrats, right? Uh, corrupt government officials who engage parties who are not well equipped to deliver an infrastructure project of some quality. So much of the research in this area focuses on what kind of institutions that we need to have and what kind of contractual arrangement that we need to enforce to make sure that this double model has a problem is appropriately internalized. Okay. Um, what are some of the uh, you know, successful uh, infrastructure projects that we see abroad, and to some extent that is already happening uh, in India? Uh, for example, if you, uh, in England, for example, the Heathrow Airport, the Gatwick Airport, and the City Airport are all privately managed. The Paris Airport is privately managed. A lot of the water supply and energy supply in Britain is done through private sector. Okay. To me, one of the shining examples of uh, infrastructure success is the Hong Kong Metro project. 
So what do they do uh, you know, in the Hong Kong Metro project that works so well? Uh, just to give you an amazing statistic, if you look at the fare box uh, recovery ratio, which is the amount of the operating cost uh, that is funded by the revenues that comes into the Metropolitan Authority, that is 185%. That's just an amazing amount uh, of revenue that they're generating. How did they manage to do it? They do what is called a value capture. This value capture is essentially possible because when you buy a ticket in the Hong Kong Metro, you can use that ticket for buses, you can use it for ferry. So the volume that goes through that system is very, very high. And the authority is going to take a cut in all the profits associated with the development rights that happen along the Metro route. So there is this additional revenue stream that is coming, and it's a question of contracting that revenue stream among the three parties that we talked about uh, in the earlier presentation. They have done it very successfully, and therefore, this is a very successful model of infrastructure that we have seen. OK, so what are some of the, uh, you know, uh, the models of uh, infrastructure financing say about what we should be doing in order to solve this contracting problem? One uh, very good example that we can learn from is the institutional arrangement in uh, home financing uh, in the United States. The Federal Home Loan Bank is a very critical institution that provides low-cost financing to banks. And during the height of the crisis, even before the Federal Reserve kicked in, uh, you know, the Federal Home Loan Bank was a key player in making sure that the banks were getting low-cost assistance. So we need development banks. Uh, in the infrastructure area to really promote infrastructure funding. This has already been recognized in Europe. This has already been recognized in China. So the China Development Bank and the European uh, Investment Bank, they have huge balance sheets, and they're able to build capacity. They're able to do credit enhancement, and they're able to provide coordination among various players. So over a period of time, they've acquired a great deal of skills in executing complex infrastructure projects. Now they're exporting some of their human capital to funding uh, infrastructure projects abroad. Okay, so this we have seen is a very useful institutional structure. The other is the governance. So most of the infrastructure investment in the United States is done through the municipal bond market. In other words, uh, every state can go out and issue these municipal bonds and the reliance uh, is more on the bond market as opposed to banks, okay? which is something that I believe India has neglected over a period of time. We have relied on banks for too many uh, things, whereas it's the, really the bond market is one of the places where we can go to, where you can issue long-term bonds. One of the issues that has come up today is the macroeconomic conditions in the bond market. The interest, rate, interest rates are at an all-time low. The infrastructure needs are at an all-time high. This is a very serendipitous uh, situation. My colleague Tono is going to talk a little bit about the savings glut, and he will tell you a little bit about whether it is possible to tap into this low you know, interest rate environment to fund some of this long-term project. So muni bond market is a very good model. It also gives the infrastructure investors an exit option. If I'm a bond investor, uh, if I don't want to be exposed to infrastructure, I can sell the bond and move up, right? So it's a very nice way for us to think about uh, infrastructure financing. And what about some of the double model hazard and what are some of the contracting issues that need to be dealt with? Escrowing the government funds, okay? In other words, if government has to deliver, acquire the lands before a certain point in time, right? The government has to do the environmental clearance. It's not doing its job then there should be a penalty that should be paid by the government. That should be escrowed out so that if a new party comes to power, that funds don't disappear, right? So we need to make sure that there is a credible, transparent mechanism for transferring the funds from the government to a third party, right? Performance-linked uh, and clawback provisions. In other words, if the infra builder is using low quality material and the expected life of the infra project has, as a result come down, we should be able to claw back, right? Uh, from the infra builder, some of the uh, you know, monies that was paid uh, in the first place. So this could be uh, put in place. A lot of the times we find that the infrastructure uh, projects get into litigation, and we need a common uh, you know, litigation procedure where there's an international arbitration. So somebody with some authority is going to be able to say in a timely fashion, this is how the disputes, contractual disputes are going to be resolved, and that would be a binding agreement for all the parties in the so that, those are some of the insights that come out of these models. And uh, to, to conclude, 
I would simply say that we need to build some credible institutions uh, and some contractual agreements. And not all uh, infrastructure projects will have the value capture that I talked about in the context of the Hong Kong Metro Authority. But there are certainly quite a number of projects in which this is true. And we should be able to take that into account <coughs> to make uh, that value capture divided in a reasonable way across the four players uh, in the infrastructure uh, project. And finally, uh, we shouldn't rely too much on bank funding for the infrastructure, especially in the in Indian context. The non-performing loans in the infrastructure loans, I mean, uh, infrastructure projects have been quite heavy. This is probably not the way we want to go. Thank you.